Welcome to GED Mastery. Let's get into this practice test. If you balance the following chemical equation, how many moles of water would there be? So the water, H2O, is right here. So they're asking what number would be in front of that H2O. So let's balance the equation and find out. We've got three carbons on the left, eight hydrogens, and two oxygens. And then we've got one carbon on the right, two hydrogens, and two plus one makes three oxygens. Let's balance our carbon first. We need three on this side to make it equal, so let's put a three in front of here. That makes three carbons and it changes our oxygen. So let's redo our oxygen count. Three times two is six oxygens right here, plus the one over here makes seven. Let's balance our hydrogen next. We need more on this side. We need a total of eight. So let's put a four here. Four times two is eight hydrogen. But we've got to redo our oxygen count again. We've got three times two, six oxygen plus four oxygen over here now, which is 10. And so to make 10 oxygen on this side, I'm gonna put a five right here. And now we're totally balanced. So how many moles of water are there? Four, so our answer is D. The kinetic energy of an object in motion depends on its mass, M, and speed, V. What is the kinetic energy in joules of an 867 kilogram car moving at a speed of 35 meters per second? And they give us this formula here. So let's go ahead and plug everything in. Ke equals one half times m, and we know m is the mass, and mass is often expressed in kilograms, so we've got 867 in place of the m here, and then times v squared. V is the speed. They tell us the speed is 35, and then we do have to square that. So now all we have to do is enter it into the calculator. And here's our answer. Let's go ahead and write that down. Five, three, one, oh, three, seven, point five. And none of our answers look exactly like that, but that's because they're in scientific notation. So let's make this number in scientific notation by moving the decimal place to the left. In scientific notation, you can only have one number before the decimal point. And let's count as we go. One, two, three, four, five. So it would be 5.31, and since we moved the decimal to the left five places, we're gonna have to multiply it by 10 to the fifth. So our answer is C. Tanya made a graph of ticket prices for rock concerts and the number of people attending those concerts. What is the independent variable? Well, remember, if you have your four fingers pointing upward with your thumb out to the side, your thumb is independent of those other fingers, so that horizontal axis is the independent variable. So it would be ticket price. And the dependent variable is the vertical axis. So the dependent variable would be the number of people attending. In a certain dog species, black fur is the dominant trait while gray fur is recessive. A heterozygous dog is crossed with a dog with gray fur. What is the probability that their puppy would have black fur? So let's go ahead and set up the Punnett square. It says a heterozygous dog is crossed. So let's do that one first. Heterozygous means the alleles are different, so we'll have one big and one little. And I just picked B, it really doesn't matter what letter you pick. Now it's crossed with a dog with gray fur, and since gray fur is recessive, that means that for that trait to be expressed, both alleles need to be 
recessive. So both b's will be little. And now we're ready to complete the Punnett square. So big B, little b. And this square is little b, little b. Big B, little b. Little b, little b. So which puppy would have black fur? Well, since black fur is the dominant trait, we'll pick any of the possibilities of offspring that have a capital B in them. So that's these two out of four, which is 50%. A city measured its rainfall over a period of 14 days. Here's the data in inches. What is the median and the mode of the data? So the median is the middle, but we can't just pick the middle if the numbers are not ordered. So we have to put them either in ascending or descending order. So let's go ahead and do that. And I'm going to cross out the numbers as I go to make sure I don't forget one. So I'll start with a zero. I've got another zero. 0 0.5. 0 0.5, 0 0 0.6, 1.0, 1.1, 1.1, 1.1, 1.2, 1.4, 1 1.4, 2.1, 2 and 2.3. I'll just put that over here. So if I want to find the middle, I could either cross a number off at the top and at the bottom and keep working my way down until I get to the middle. Or, since there's 14 numbers, I know the first half would be 1 through 7, and the second half would be 8 through 14. So the seventh and eighth numbers will be the two middle numbers. So I could count up to 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So these are my seventh and eighth numbers. And since they're actually the same, I don't have to do anything. I know that my median is 1.1. If they were different, I would add them up and divide by 2. So I know it's not A and it's not C, but it could be B or D. So let's look at the mode. The mode is the number that occurs most frequently, and there's 1, 2, 3, 1.1s. So my median and mode are both 1.1. In this single replacement reaction, how many moles of aluminum chloride would there be? So let's go ahead and balance the chemical equation. I've got one copper, two chlorine, and one aluminum. And on this side, I've got one copper, three chlorine, and one aluminum. So the only thing that's not balanced right now is the chlorine, so let's balance that. And since these little numbers are here and I can't change them, I'm going to have to find a common multiple of 2 and 3. So the lowest common multiple would be 6, so let's make 6 chlorine on each side. To do that here, I'm going to put a 3, which makes 6 chlorine, but it also changes my copper. And here, to make 6 chlorine, I'm going to put a 2. So I've got 6, but it also changed my aluminum. Now let's balance the copper. I need 3 on this side, and that's an easy fix. So I've got 3 coppers on both sides. And on this side, I need 2 aluminum. Also an easy fix. And now I'm completely balanced. So how many moles of aluminum chloride would there be? Well, this is aluminum chloride. No other part of the chemical equation has aluminum and chlorine together. So there's two moles of aluminum chloride. 
The gravitational force between two masses can be found with the formula below, where g equals 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th newtons times meters squared over kilograms squared. Then they give us a formula. What is the gravitational force between Mars and a 65 kilogram object on Mars, which has a mass of 6.42 times 10 to the 23rd kilograms and a radius of 3.39 times 10 to the 6 meters. And let's go ahead and put everything in the formula. So we've got F equals G, which is this number right here, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. Put that in parentheses. And then times M, M1 and M2. They're both followed by kilograms, so I know they're both masses. So times 65 times 6.42 times 10 to the 23rd. And that's all over R squared. Here's my radius, 3.39 times 10 to the 6th and that whole thing is squared. Now all we have to do is enter it into the calculator. So there we go, we got 242.2, and this is our closest answer choice. A research project had the following hypothesis. If a car is washed and not dried on a cloudy day, it will have fewer water spots than a car that is washed and not dried on a sunny day. What is the independent variable? Remember that the independent variable is what you change in an experiment. You can also think of it as the cause while the dependent variable is the effect. So what are you changing? Well, the only thing that's different between these two groups is that one is on a sunny day and one is on a cloudy day. So that's the thing you're changing. And the closest answer choice would be B, the amount of cloud cover. The dependent variable would be the effect of that. So the dependent variable would be the amount of water spots. Brown eyes in humans are dominant to blue eyes. A homozygous dominant man has a child with a blue-eyed woman. What is the chance their child will be blue-eyed? So we've got a homozygous dominant man. So that means both of his alleles are the same. So he's big B, big B. And he has a child with a blue-eyed woman. Since blue eyes is recessive for that trait to be expressed, both of those alleles need to be recessive. Let's complete the Punnett square. Big B, little b. Big B, little b. Big B, little b. And big B, little b. So it's 100% big B, little b. And all of those are brown-eyed because they all have one dominant allele. And when that dominant allele is present, that's what's going to be expressed. So what is the chance their child will be blue-eyed? Zero percent. In some species, parental age has a negative effect on the lifespan of offspring, known as the Lansing effect. A study was done on the effect of maternal age on fruit fly lifespan. The results are in the table. What is the mean offspring lifespan? So we've got two columns in our table. One is the age of the mother, and one is the average offspring lifespan. And that's what we want to look at, the offspring lifespan. So they want the mean of this column 
of data. So let's go ahead and find that. Remember to find the mean, we're gonna add everything up and divide by however many numbers there are. So let's add them up first. So at this point, it's important to hit enter first to find your sum. If you hit divide before you hit enter, it would only do 40 divided by 5, not that whole sum divided by 5, so that's important. Now I'm going to divide by however many numbers there are. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so I'll divide my answer by 5, and there we go. 52.8 days is my answer, D. If you need to refresh your memory on any of these concepts, review videos 1 through 5, you've got this.